So we, we talked about doing this for a long time because I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position now that I get to travel a lot, um, everywhere really, mostly at uh, either really lovely literary festivals where, where it's all full of writers and, and, and people who like writing, or um, bookshops. 95% of the bookshops I go to are kind of independent bookshops because that's where publishers send you to sort of show the love to the independent sector. And it's fascinating going around the United States and Europe, UK and Australia and, and Asia, going into all of these different uh, independent bookstores because they're all run by slightly quirky characters. <laughs> and <laughs> because you, only a quirky character bookshop um, and they're all uh, they're all they're all very interesting people and every single uh, bookshop as well independent bookshop also has a group of loyal community people from the community that come to them and that's why it's lovely to go to them because wherever I go you know I'll end up in towns where I don't think anyone's interested in China old or new um, and where no one's particularly interested in me particularly but they come out and they support the bookshop and, and that's kind of really fantastic and you know it, it's always amazing to see and I have to tell you the good news is I think uh, is it's certainly true that in certainly the UK and the US independent bookstores are doing better than they have done for the last few years so the actual you know provable revenues at independent bookstores were up in America quite significantly and also in the UK and it's one of the few sectors that are actually opening shops there are more independent bookstores now than, um, than there was two, three, five, certainly ten years ago. So the day of the big chain uh, has gone and the small chain and the independent is kind of doing it. And they're holding up very well against our friends at Amazon. And um, the ebook thing seems to have plateaued. Uh, most authors that I know, like me, are, are not seeing any growth in their e-revenues. I mean, it, it's just growing in line with your sales. Um, audio is doing very well. Uh, but um, it's so, so the time of the independent bookstore is really now and the community bookstore and all of them are all wonderful. They're all tied in with local craft breweries and wine dealers and local confectionery manufacturers and bakers. I mean, everywhere you go, you get wonderful treats uh, going into bookshops and they're, all, and they're all great and they're all run by real characters. Um, and the other reason that it's nice to be here is if you think that people who run independent bookstores are quirky characters, you should meet independent publishers. And if you want to meet really quirky independent publishers, you should come to Asia because it's probably one of the most difficult places to be an independent publisher in terms of the number of outlets you've got and everything else. So um, I had known Pete Spurrier here at Blacksmith Books for quite a long time. I'd always thought it would be lovely to do something together, um, you know, but I wasn't quite sure what the right sort of book and the right sort of product to do with it was. Um, imagine being an, ind an independent publisher in the UK or the US has a very hard time. The, the big publishers are not just big publishers, they're parts of enormous media conglomerates now. And um, they control what goes in the window at bookshops, they control what goes on the tables, they control what gets reviewed in the newspapers, they, they control everything as much as they can. And it's very, very difficult to break through that. And of course, here in Asia, particularly with Pete's business, even more difficult to break through because you've got Hong Kong, but then you know, you're trying to sell books that have a China interest and China has got you know, all the censorship hoops you've got to jump through and then not many bookshops to sell to and very conservative buying practices at those bookshops. So, so really difficult and really tough to sort of um, find a way through it. So independent bookstores and independent publishers are all wonderful people. I wouldn't necessarily want my sister to marry one, but they're, they're, all, uh, they're all really fantastic. Um, and, and it's great to be able to work with them. And obviously I'd come to Hong Kong for many, many years. And in recent years, due to, to friends that moved here, I'd been coming into Moi Wo and around here. So I'd seen obviously the, the changes in the bookshop and I thought like, wouldn't it be nice? And Phil at RTHK who drags me onto his radio show every so often, uh, thought, wouldn't it be nice to come and do something? So, so Community bookshops, independent bookstops survive and I get book sales uh, through so many community and independent bookshops because people come out and support events like this. So thank you very much for coming because it's a really important uh, resource in the community. Um, having said that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I do. Um, I've sort of ended up in, that, in, a, in, a, in a, what I think is a very nice space. 
because I never thought when I was I would, the usual route of Chinese at university, some time studying Mandarin in Shanghai, and then back to do a sort of proper job in, in China for a long time, and eventually spent another 23 years in, in Shanghai, unbelievably. Somehow that 23 years went past. And um, I was always working on history, Chinese history, and I always mm -hmm. wanted to, to sort of tell Chinese stories. And I was particularly fascinated in the stories of the foreign community that had lived, particularly in Shanghai, where I, where I lived all of my China time. I mean, I, mean, I really am a, a Shanghai guy. Um, despite the fact I'm best known for, for Beijing, which really does annoy some people in Beijing who are trying to publish books that a Shanghai guy should end up doing the book on Beijing that everyone reads. But um, I uh, always wanted to tell the stories of the foreign community in, uh, in, in China because 1949, the bamboo curtain came down and we kind of lost our collective generational memory of, of the foreigners that had been in Shanghai and to a lesser extent in Beijing and elsewhere in China. And, you know, places that were really, really important before 1949, the most advanced city in Asia in many, many ways, Shanghai, and the great intellectual scholarly uh, capital uh, of, of Beijing, slightly fell off our radar. And, and up came, you know, what the Shanghai, Shanghainese would have called in the 1930s, that dingy little port to the south full of English soldiers getting drunk and, and going marauding if you didn't die of some sort of horrible disease first, which you know as Hong Kong. And um, Hong Kong, you know, of course, at that period was really couldn't have held a candle to, to Shanghai in terms of the nightlife, the culture, the modernity of it. So I was always fascinated with these two places. On the one hand, you had Beijing, which stood for the aesthetic of China, and that's why people like Harold Acton and Desmond Parsons and the great British aesthetes uh, went, went to Beijing um, because that was where, you know, the culture was. It is China's, well, we don't hear it much now, but it is China's Rome. It is the center of religions and belief systems in China. It, it is one of, the, one of the longest running uh, historic capitals of the city and the scholarly center of, of China. Um, Shanghai, I love for a different reason. It's because of modernity. It was the city of the avant-garde. It was the city of, uh, well, I mean, the basic stuff, like the first place to have lifts and central heating and telephones in hotel rooms and, and all that kind of cool stuff, neon signs and jazz clubs and all of that that we all love about Shanghai. But it was also um, a place of uh, great uh, culture as well. Now, even though the term high pi, the east-west notion of Shanghai, was invented as an insult by the, by the Beijing intellectuals who believed that Jing pi, the, the, the Beijing uh, culture, was a much superior culture, of course the Shanghainese turned the term high pi to their advantage and argued that that's what they were going to do. And I'll come back to Shanghai. I started out kind of really just writing on weekends, like everybody does, scribbling things together and published several books down here actually with Hong Kong University Press with, with whom I still have a good relationship. And they were the kind of books about foreigners in China. I did one on a guy called Carl Crow who was an um, uh, American advertising guy who came to Shanghai in 1911, created the first Western advertising agency in China. And if you know the Shanghai Calendar Girl adverts uh, with all the women in beautiful Chong Sam, uh, he created that concept on the grounds that you could not sell clothes fashion to, to the Shanghainese. They, they, they didn't need to be told anything about fashion. They had their own fashions. What you could sell them was cosmetics and permanent wave kits and things like that. So if you look at those posters, it's all beautiful Chong Sams and it's all then women with shorter bobbed curly hair and uh, rouge and lipstick. And that's largely what they were selling. And so the tradition of the calendar girl poster, now very collectible, of course, um, really started with, um, with Crow. So I wanted to write about him. But that's a rather esoteric uh, sort of interest. Um, and then I wanted to do a history of foreign journalists in China. And I think because I had been reading so many uh, rec you know, reports from foreign journalists in the 19... Well, really from the Opium Wars th through to the Second World War, and also because the work I was doing in market research and advertising and so on, I would constantly get people saying, 
you know, China is the big story. China is the only story. We, all we think about is China. And I was like, well, actually, if you do an analysis, which I kind of rather boringly did, of the major newspaper, international newspapers, the number of column inches devoted to China now and over the last 20 years since I did that book is significantly less than it was from the late 19th century through to the Second World War. There was more written about China. China now is a sort of reasonably interesting story, depending on what part of the world you sit in. Um, but it's a business story by and large. I mean, now there are some political issues, but it's a business story. It's a trade wars story. The China of the first half of the 20th century was much, much more than that. The story about China in the first half of the 20th century was, will China even continue to exist as a country? Or will it just break apart into warlord-controlled territories? You know, will, will the Canton government split off from the Beijing government? Will Manchuria just be taken over by warlords? Will whole areas of the country just go off? Or will it become a federal country? Um, what are, the, what are the, 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 the actual definitions of the size of, uh, of China? And these were all massive questions in, uh, in the 1920s. And they're much, much bigger questions than, than we kind of think about now. So um, please, you can go and buy books. You, yeah, can, you can wander through and buy books, don't worry. Talk, but yeah. So I really wanted to write about those interesting characters that came, but also to, to talk about how we should kind of get China in perspective and we should understand that the, that the China that we deal with now is a result of all of that process, but also in a sense, in many ways, not quite as interesting, not quite as globally pivotal as it perhaps was, uh, of course, and in the Second World War. It is where the Second World War starts, after all, in 1937. So I was doing that, and I was doing it on weekends, and it was being published, and um, I was sort of interested in that, and I was looking into the lives of foreigners in Shanghai and Beijing. I mean, I should explain I had a family interest, which was that my great-grandfather was with the Royal Navy, in, um, in Shanghai in the 1920s running the coaling station for the uh, Far East Squadron that went from Hong Kong up to Shanghai and Shanghai up to Wei Highway and a little bit up the Yangtze and patrolled that route. And he, he controlled the coal supply so that they could, that, so could re coal. And um, when I was a young child, and I'm sort of giving my age away now, obviously to you I appear to be in my late 20s, but in actual <laughs> fact, um, in, the, in the 1970s, when I was a young man, uh, a young kid, um, in the early 1970s actually, I used to go to um, Tottenham in North London where my great-grandfather lived. And it, because he had worked in coal and coaling and shoveling coal in through the First World War, he shoveled coal, he had the most enormous arms. And obviously he could sort of balance, balance these trays on there and everything. And, um, and there's a funny thing about English people. Well reading the news at the moment for the last few months there's a lot of funny things about English people but there's <laughs> some of them not so funny but there's um, there's a funny thing about English people which working class people which is you have a house and uh, it has a nice living room and maybe another room but you never go into it except at Christmas or funerals right and you spend your entire life in a little tiny room at the back of the house drinking tea and eating biscuits and drinking tea out of a saucer quite often which is even more weird which is what they used to do and um, I, we would all sit out there in the summer and my great-grandfather would have a vest on, you know, he didn't wear a shirt. And all, on, on both of his hands, he had a dragon's head tattooed. And then um, it, the dragon went all the way up both arms and then crossed at the back and down between his shoulders, the tails crossed and it went all the way down his back to the sort of crack of his ass. It was an enormous tattoo. At a time, I might add, when it, well, it wasn't the case that every idiot with a beard had a tattoo at that time, right? You know, like now everybody has a tattoo. But at that time, only really sort of soldiers, sailors and boxers had kind of tattoos. So um, I was always fascinated by this. And um, I would always, and it was still, because he had such big arms, it was such a, such a big tattoo. And I'd say, oh, great, great granddad, where did you get that tattoo? And he would say, Shanghai. And then he would wink like that, at which point my great grandmother, who was fairly tough as well, would lean over and just, hit the back of his head like that and I never understood that right because later I understood that that wink meant that was the best time of my life it was the most amazing place I ever went and perhaps you should go and find out if it's quite as amazing so that was kind of how I got into I mean that's a rather odd route to ending up doing five years of Chinese at university but it's sort of that's kind of what happened and I never got a tat either <laughs>
um, because I could just never match match that level of tattoo. Um, so, so I was always interested in these people. But of course, after 1949, we forgot them. We, la we largely kind of forgot these people. And then when we all went back to do business again in the 1980s and so on, and the first sort of groups of students like me went in the, in the 1980s to China, um, we kind of had lost that entire, entire world. But I was very lucky when I went to Shanghai in 1987 that because Deng Xiaoping very cleverly decided that as you opened up the country, the last place you should open up would be Shanghai. Because, of course, if he'd opened up Shanghai first, it would have swallowed everything, right? And with its networks down here, right? Remember, Tung Chi Hua and people, they're all Shanghai families down here, the big families. And, and in Singapore and elsewhere, they would have just swallowed everything up and there would have been nothing left for anyone else. So he left it till last. So when I turned up in 1987, it was as if a dust sheet had been thrown over the city in 19... Well, not 1949 exactly, but about 1952, 53. And nothing had changed. Pudong didn't really exist at that point. Well, it existed, but not, not, not in the way it is now. And it was just, you know, mile after mile after mile of low-level, one-story, Shikoman, Lilong, and, and Longtang housing. Um, and, and even at that point, Beijing was, again, you know, I mean, 1949, Beijing had 4,500 hutongs. Now Beijing has less than 300 hutongs. And not one of those is pristine. Uh, they've all got gaps in them. So, you know, but when I went to Beijing, I think there was something like 2,800, which felt like a lot at the time. So, you know, just miles and miles of them stretching away. So, um, so obviously that, that kind of got me interested in who lived in these places and so on. So I did a few books and I decided that was quite good. And then I thought I need a new challenge. So I thought what I want to do is I want to kind of do a book that takes Chinese history and a Chinese story to a much, much wider audience that, that kind of by using a really good story, and I think crime is a really good story because if you go in any bookshop in the world and every culture in the world, really, everybody reads crime books. Right? It's always the biggest genre in, in everywhere, on TV, in, 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 in bookshops, everywhere. So I thought, let's find a really good crime story that by luring people in to read a crime story, they will get a Chinese history lesson. They just won't know that they've had a Chinese history lesson. They'll think they're just reading a crime book. And I looked around for quite a long time. Um, and in fact, I started work on City of Devils because my other aim was I wanted to do the like 1930s Shanghai book to end all 1930s Shanghai books. I wanted to like just draw a line under 1930s Shanghai and say, now no one can ever do a better book on 1930s Shanghai. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's going to have on one hand, it's going to have the gangsters and the girls and the jazz and the opium and everything. And on the other hand, it's also going to deal with how crappy the situation was in the city and how tough it was to live there. And we're going to do the whole thing. And then the Japanese are going to come in. And, that, and that's just going to be it, right? No one's ever going to touch the subject again. They'll be too scared. And um, I started work on that. But of course, old Shanghai is such a massive subject. I ended up with just pages and pages and pages. At one point, I came across the story of the murder in Peking in uh, January 1937 of Pamela Werner and the fact that this murder had never been solved. And I thought, you come across lots of stories, and some of them go in the South China Morning Post Sunday magazine, and some of them get lost, and some of them get worked up into something for Destination Shanghai. Others become books. And I pulled and pulled and pulled at this thread of Pamela Werner. And it got better and better. So I found out that she was murdered, and it was a horrible murder, but that it had never been solved. And I thought, well, unsolved murder is a, a really major thing a major thing for us to, to sort of deal with in all cultures and societies. The idea that murder should go unpunished is a, is, is, is a very emotional one. Secondly, the case, of course, because it was Beijing, came to Inspector Han Shiqing, who was the head of detectives for the Beijing city at that time. But because it was a foreigner and because there was a British policeman in the British concession in Tianjin who was Scotland Yard trained, he was brought over and the two worked together. And I have I know of no other instance before or after where a British and a Chinese detective work together to try and solve a murder. So I this is a really good, a really good example of sort of, you know, Sino-British understanding. And if we all work together, won't it be great? Of course, as, as it works out in history of trade as well as in uh, crime, um, that, that working together, they didn't manage to solve it. So it, it doesn't necessarily help if you work together. Um, though, of course, the Japanese invasion of China had that, which was the other element that I wanted, which was the investigation hits a brick wall because in July that year, the Japanese invade the city. And for me, July the 7th, 1937, 
uh, when Japan moved down from Manchuria and invaded and occupied Peking and Tianjin is really the start of the Second World War. Because after that, of course, that's July. By August, they're attacking Shanghai. In September, of course, we have the horrific rape of Nanjing and the Chinese government moving to Chongqing and the move down to the south of China by the Japanese. At that point, uh, of course, Japan is going to then clash in Indochina with the French and in Hong Kong with the British. And that will be the two empires. And then if they're dealt with, as, they, as of course we know they were, with the fall of Singapore and the fall of Hong Kong, um, then um, it will be two great powers facing each other against the, across the Pacific, Japan and the United States. And we know that on the 8th of December 1941, Pearl Harbor, of course, then we're into a full war. But that process starts, I think, on July the 7th. 1937. And, and I wanted to get that across to readers around the world. In Europe, you know, we all think it's September 1939. In America, they all think it's December 1941. And I wanted people to understand that the war starts in September, in July, sorry, 1937, in China. And that China fought eight, nearly nine years of war against, uh, against Japan. Um, you know, s s nearly, nearly a decade of, of total war against the Japanese. So, and I also imagine that that would be a book that would be about all of this going on. Detectives working together, the world of Peking at that time, the hutongs, the traditional life of Peking, and the foreign community that had this rather lost to history area called the Badlands of Peking, which is not a very big area compared to the sort of Badlands of Shanghai, which is half the city but in the night by 1940. But there was an area where foreigners uh, sold drugs, dealt drugs, drank prostitution, all the rest of it. And that had kind of been left out of the history book. So I thought that'll be good and we'll be fine. And then I was, I was in London trying to research all the last bits of the, the case. And I was in the National Archive, the UK National Archive in Kew. And I was looking through boxes of things. And now, I mean, they have done an incredible job at Kew of trying to digitize the British Archive, which is every piece of paper that's ever been through the British government and every embassy and consulate and law court and everything is in that one archive. So they're digitizing and digitizing, but they have priorities. So basically the priorities start from anything with a signature that says Churchill on it gets digitized first, and then you move down from there, right? And I was looking, so, so there's still tons and tons of boxes that are just full of papers that no one's got around to digitizing. They're just down in the seven floors of basement that they've got there. And uh, there was a box there that said uh, British Consul General, uh, Consulate General, because of course um, after 1927 Beijing was not the capital, it was Nanjing, so it wasn't an embassy, it was a consulate. Uh, uh, 1942. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because, like, who is in the British consulate in Beijing, the former British embassy in Beijing, sending out paperwork in 1942? Oh, they've either left or they've now been interned in Japanese internment camps. So who's in the, who's in the embassy? So I called it up and um, actually uh, uh, all the paperwork and a, literally a box of dust comes up. I have a picture of it somewhere uh, that no one's ever looked at because it's never sort of seemed relevant. And on top of it was various sheets of paper. It was these endless letters from a Chinese guy who before Pearl Harbor had been paid to dry clean the curtains of the British Embassy, right? And then, they, then Pearl Harbor had happened and all the British had either left or been arrested by the Japanese to take for internment. And he hadn't been paid. So he was writing letter after letter to the British Embassy saying, I cleaned your curtains, right? I've returned your curtains, where's my money? Right? And of course, there's no one to reply to him. So somewhere out there is still a Chinese family that <laughs> hates the British because we never paid for our curtains, to dry cleaning of our curtains. So I sort of waded through that and I thought, oh, this is hopeless. This is just going to be a load of bad debts that, that, that were caused. And then in there was about a 150 page document from Pamela's father, who had been a former diplomat in China and was a great sinologist in his own right, ETC Werner, Edward Werner. And he had tried to investigate the murder. And when I went back and cross-referenced and cross-referenced and tried to use the work that I'd got, the autopsy report, the police reports I had, the newspaper reports, the various, I mean, I, research, I was researching that book around 2010, 2011. So at that time, I was still able to find about six or seven people who had been to school with Pamela, who were then in their late 80s and early 90s, who had recollections. So I did have some primary sources. 
And I think he got the right answer. So, so the book is really um, what happened during the police investigation, what happened at the murder and what happened during the police investigation, and then a switch because obviously Inspector Han was a high-level member of the Guomindang, and as soon as the Japanese came, he had to disappear. Uh, Inspector Dennis, who was the British policeman, as soon as Tianjin was invaded, had to go back to organize the defense of the British concession of Tianjin. And the father investigated the case, and I think he came to the right conclusion. Now, if you go on the internet, you'll know that there's lots of people who think I'm wrong, and that the father murdered her, and that lots of other people did it. And I think they all have their own motivations for that. Some of it is just nuts, conspiracy theories, um, some of it is, is to do with people being upset about things I might have said about their relations, um, which, which I sort of stand by. I mean, I'm sorry, if you've got a horrible grandfather, you've just got a horrible grandfather, and that's just what it is. But other people kind of uh, embraced it. I mean, there's one character in there who's British who worked for the Japanese, and when he got on a boat and went back to Britain, he was arrested under what was called Regulation 18B, which was if you'd, if you'd uh, sympathise with the Nazis or the Japanese, you were arrested and placed in a internment camp in Britain, actually at Aintree Racecourse in Liverpool. That's where he spent the rest of the war. And I got contacted by his family who said, oh, we didn't really know that. Because after the war, he emigrated to Australia. And I got the granddaughter who said, well, he was just my lovely grandfather. And I know he was in China and then he never talked about the war much. And I was like, you know, okay. So I think if you're, if you're British, there isn't really anything worse than being told there's a Nazi in the attic in your family, right? It's like, it's the absolute worst, right? I mean, there's like, you can't think of anything worse. I mean, I do have a, I, yeah, I, my son has a father-in-law who's a Brexiteer, and that's pretty bad. But to have an actual, you know, convicted Nazi in the family is quite bad. So um, they sort of were quite angry about it for a while, but I did what I do with everyone when they contact me about their family members. I just document dump on them and say, look, just read all of this in chronological order and see what conclusion you come to. And they've actually embraced it, and they're now writing a biography of their, of their pro-Nazi, pro-Japanese uh, grandfather, which I'm sort of quite looking forward to. But for a while, they were resistant. Now they've embraced it. So, so that sort of happens. Anyway, that book did, um, that, I mean, I, I guess my original theory of how do you write a book that everyone in the world will read and will give them a Chinese lesson but will be a good story kind of worked. Um, and so everybody kind of liked it. And in fact, there was so many people contacted me who either had been in Beijing at that time as children and remembered the case and had little facts about the case or were relatives of various people that were mentioned in the book or had information on people that were in the book that I ended up doing another book called The Badlands, which was really just short stories built up from all the information that came into me. And this is like uh, one thing I'll talk about in a minute, which is just um, uh, the amount of stuff I now get from people whose families were, were in China kind of will keep me busy, you know, until they cart me off to an old people's home somewhere. I mean, I've got enough material now from all of these people, photographs, letters, everything that gets sent to me. So I, I got, once you do a book like uh, that, um, and it comes out sort of all around the world and it does very well and wins a couple of awards so it gets a lot of attention. Um, everything comes out the woodwork and I hadn't really been expecting that. You know, all of these people come and they start sending you photos and they tell you little stories. One woman said to me, oh, you talk about one person in the book and you don't quite know what happened to them. And I'm like, no, I don't really know what happened to them. We thought they might be involved, they weren't. And they went, oh, don't you understand? They were the owner of this nightclub. They just never told anyone about it. It was a silent ownership. And this was a 93-year-old lady in Sydney, Australia. And I just said, like, you're the only person that knows that piece of information. That piece of information only exists in your head. There's no paperwork left in China to prove it. It's just something that she told me. But she read the book and just sort of assumed everybody knew this. Right? And I'm just like, no, you're the only person left living who knows it. So I got that. So then I thought after that, I better go back to the Shanghai book I was doing, which now had become the tricky second album kind of thing, right? After the success of the first one. And I wanted to go back and do, do that story. And I realized that, at first of all, I thought I could do a kind of Berlin Alexanderplatz thing where, where you do a book where the city is the, major, is, is the character and real people are not that important. And I think Shanghai is good enough. You know, it's a good enough city for that. And I wanted to tell all the stories of the people that came to Shanghai in the 1930s and 40s, but all the stories of the people in, that came to Shanghai in the 1930s and 40s, which I did tell, turned out to be a kind of 5,000-page manuscript, which, funnily enough, Penguin 
were not that happy to receive <laughs> and just sort of sent it back to me and went, you've got to drill it down. So I did. And I ended up with two guys who I thought really summed up foreign Shanghai in the 1930s. And obviously, I don't want to tell stories about missionaries or businessmen or diplomats. It's, it's all about the, the slightly recherche kind of underworld people that went to China. Um, and it was about a guy called, uh, and of course, no one in Shanghai ever has their real name. It is the only city in the world where you can just get off a boat and, and you don't need a passport or a visa. I mean, you know, uh, Casablanca is an invention of Hollywood. Shanghai was the only city where you could do this. And he called himself uh, Joe Farron, but his real name was Josef Pollack. He was from the Jewish ghetto of Vienna. He was a very good dancer. And he met a woman. He went on a tour of Asia showing people in Singapore and Hong Kong and everywhere how to waltz and do the different dances. And he met a white Russian, a Russian emigre woman. And she changed her name to Nellie Farron, although I can't actually prove they ever got married. And um, they toured together as a couple dancing, a sort of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers of, of Asia. And um, Joe had a, a dream that he could build the biggest nightclub and casino that the world had ever seen. Um, and he did. At the time that he built Farron's nightclub in the west of Shanghai, it was the single largest nightclub and casino in the world. It was six floors. It had more roulette tables than Monte Carlo. It had more slot machines than, than Reno at that time, which was just getting going. Las Vegas was still just desert. Um, it, was, it was phenomenal. Um, but he needed someone to bankroll it, and he met a guy who was called Jack Riley, who certainly was not born Jack Riley. <laughs> Jack Riley was a character who had been in the U.S. Navy and had been out to Shanghai with the U.S. Navy, had gone back and got caught up in J. Edgar Hoover's war on the public enemies. He'd been given 35 years for a kidnapping in Tulsa. And but he was a good baseball player because he'd been in the U.S. Navy baseball team. And when the baseball team went out to play in the local town at McNeil in Oklahoma, where the Oklahoma State Penitentiary is, everybody went back into the prison, turned right to go back to the prison. Jack turned left, jumped on a train, managed to get to San Francisco. Now, he knew he wanted to go back to Shanghai, but he needed to do certain things. So the first thing he did was he mugged a drunk on the Embarcadero in San Francisco who happened to be called Jack Riley, and he thought, that's a good name. There's 100,000 Jack Rileys in America. There must be 200,000 around the world. So he changed his name to Jack Riley. He then uh, threw his passport away and burnt it so that they could never prove that he was American. Because, of course, if you were in Shanghai, you were in extraterritoriality. So the only law you could break was the law of your own country, not the law of China. So um, they, uh, they, he, he knew that if you can't prove that someone was an American or someone was British, you couldn't prosecute them. They were scot-free, as they say. I know the Scots don't like that term, so I shouldn't really use it. They, they were completely free. And um, he did that. But then just to make sure, just to make sure, he bought acid. And he sat in a hotel room, and he put each of his fingers in acid, and he burnt his fingerprints off. He burnt his fingerprints off on all of this. This was a quite col common thing. John Dillinger did it, and various other ones did it. And he burnt the fingerprints off. Um, and then he got on a boat and went to Shanghai. And when he got to Shanghai, he realized that there were no laws against anything in Shanghai, really. Right? It was the sort of uber, super capitalist place on earth. Right? I mean, it was legal. Prostitution was legal. Opium smoking was legal within certain restrictions. There were no licensing hours. There was, there was, nothing, there was none of this Anglo nonsense about closing bars or anything like that. So he, he, and the one thing he noticed was that nobody, nobody had ever come up with the idea of slot machines in Shanghai, right? Because the British had never seen, who largely controlled Shanghai, had never seen slot machines. They were already in America, but the British had never seen them. So he starts shipping them over via his Navy mates through the Philippines. And at one point, he had 100,000 slot machines across the whole of Shanghai, everywhere. And everybody wanted to use them. All the soldiers, sailors, the 4th Marines, everyone was just feeding coins into them. And um, of course, the Chinese, who, you know, so rumor says, like to gamble now and again, ha love them as well. They called them dime-eating tigers. So he was all through the French concession, the international settlement, and Chinese Shanghai had these everywhere. And he was making phenomenal amounts of money. And what Joe needed to get his club up and running, Joe ran chorus lines, he ran dance halls, he had the entertainers, he made everything look slick, span. He was called the, the Ziegfeld of Shanghai. I mean, 
dapper Joe, very stylish. He needed someone who could bankroll a massive casino. And he got Jack Riley to bankroll the casino. And there is the story of how they built the biggest casino in the world. But of course, how the two of them kind of, it's not going to end well particularly. It doesn't end well largely because just as they were about to open, the Japanese attacked Shanghai. And so we go into this weird, fascinating historical period in Shanghai, which the Chinese call Gudao, or the, the lonely or solitary island period which is the Japanese have, of course, taken over everything around Shanghai and they've moved up to Nanjing and throughout the rest of the Yangtze Valley. So there's no way out of Shanghai. Um, but they don't invade the international settlement and the French concession because, of course, to do that would mean to go to war with France, Britain, America, and Japan is not ready to do that in 1937. So it leaves it. So you'd say anywhere else in the world, the city would become a ghost town. Everybody would leave. That would be the end of it, but not Shanghai. Because the great story of Shanghai, I think, is although it's a product of imperialism, you know, won in the Opium Wars by Britain largely from China and created as this split off piece of territory it, in sort of violence and cruelty, it becomes a place of refuge. I mean, first of all, it becomes a place of refuge for the Chinese, escaping the Taiping Rebellion, flood, famine, disease, um, um, warlords. Uh, censorship, right? So it becomes a city that the Chinese go to because it's easier to do business there, but also there's less uh, restrictions on them. So that's why we see Lao Shi, Lu Xun, Ba Jin, and the great modernist left-wing writers of, of China, China living in Shanghai. It's why all the great newspapers were in Shanghai, registered in the international settlement to avoid censorship as well. It's why the movie industry of China is in, is in Shanghai. And it's also, of course, why the Communist Party of China is formed in the French concession of Shanghai, right? Because if they'd been anywhere else, they'd have rounded them all up and cut their heads off, right? But they didn't, so they, they were able to do it in Shanghai. And then, of course, after 1917, Shanghai becomes home to 25, 30,000 Russians who don't want to live with the Bolsheviks, the, the white Russians or the Russian emigres. When we were translating uh, Midnight Peking originally into Chinese, the translator called me up. And it's, it's quite nice. Normally, you know, like I do a Portuguese edition. I mean, 16 languages or something. I do a Portuguese or a Norwegian edition, and the translator phones me up, and I'm like, I really can't help you, right? You know, like my Norwegian is, is, is you know, middling to poor, basically, right? So I can't do much for you. And, um, but with the Chinese one, I could sort of work with them a bit. Um, and he phoned me up, and he said, I've got this real problem. You keep using this term, white Russians. The white Russians did this. The white Russians did that. He says, I've been, I've been on Google, or because well, it was China, I've been on Bing or whatever they use up there. And I can't find any black Russians. Can't find any black Russians. All Russians appear to be white on the internet, right? So um, why do you keep using this term, right? Why do you keep using this term? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's white as opposed to red, not white as opposed to black. So, um, so we sort of found a way to get around that. Um, but there's 25, 30,000 of them in Shanghai. And then, of course, by the time I'm writing about 1937, 1938, 1939, particularly after Kristallnacht in Europe, we get another 25, perhaps 30,000 European Jews, largely from Germany and Austria, escaping uh, fascism in Europe. So we've got all of that, plus we've got all of these gangsters coming from all over the place who are just one step ahead of the law. And they all come to Shanghai as well. And then we've got all the other foreigners living there who, even if they're not technically gangsters and they're not technically refugees, are just out to make a buck any, any, any way they can because that, Shanghai is that kind of town. But the point is, even after the Japanese have invaded everywhere, none of these people can leave. Right? If you're Russian, you haven't got a passport. You've got nowhere to go and you can't get in anywhere. If you're Jewish, like at, even if you came before the persecution of the Jews in Europe, like Joe came in 1929, when he goes to the Austrian embassy now, it's controlled by the Germans he's, and he can't get a new passport because he's Jewish. So he becomes a stateless citizen as well. So these people have nowhere to go. The only thing they can do is stay and try and make the best of it. And there's still a lot of money going through Shanghai because, particularly as we get to 1939, all of the Brits and everything were told, don't come home and join the war. You need to stay in Shanghai because we need all of this stuff, whether it's tungsten, wolfram, rubber, whatever. Our traditional markets are shut off because of the Nazis. 
we need you to ship as much as possible. Your war effort will be to stay in Shanghai and ship us as much commodities as you can get down to Hong Kong, across to Singapore, and somehow back to, to Europe. So that's why Shanghai survives when it shouldn't have, have survived. And that's why these guys are able to open a casino. And it was an incredible casino. Uh, as I say, seven floors, five floors of gambling. Now, you could use cash, you could use Chinese money if you wanted to, but by that point, inflation is so crazy that an entire box of cash like that is just about enough to buy you some cigarettes or something. Right? So basically, they're doing it on gold, they're doing it on diamonds, women are selling their pearls. I mean, they're, they're, it's like a pawn shop come casino. But everybody is in the last chance saloon and everybody is spinning the wheel hoping that this might get them the money to get out of the country or at least to, to survive for a little bit longer. And of course, this all, as all of my books do, they kind of crash towards an inevitable historical moment that you can't get away from. You know in city of, in Midnight in Peking that first of all, there will be problems in July 1937 when the Japanese involved. And then even when you're carrying on the investigation after 1941, people will be interned. And in City of Devils, you know it can't go on beyond the 8th of December in Asia, not the 7th, uh, when Pearl Harbor happens because the Japanese will take over the entire city. So it's not a question of what will happen, it's just a question of who gets out, who's alive and who, who doesn't get out alive and how do they manage to do it. So that's what I did. And then in between I kept doing various other little bits and pieces in journals and other stuff, including Bloody Saturday, which is of course all about August the 14th, 1937, which was the attack on, um, on Shanghai and which has been a rather, we just passed the 80th anniversary of that, obviously, and it's been rather difficult to, um, no one else was going to do a book on Bloody Saturday, because if you know the story of Bloody Saturday, it is that the Japanese had their uh, cruiser, their big battleships in the Huangpu River, and they were shelling into Baoshan and Jiabei, and um, the Chinese Air Force came in to try and take them out. But if you know that central part of Shanghai with the Bund and everything, it's a very narrow area, very small area. The Chinese pilots missed. One bomb fell in front of the Cafe Hotel, the now the Peace Hotel. And the other one fell just over at the Da Xie Jie, the, the Great World, over at um, in the French Concession. And at that time, it was the biggest death by aerial bombardment that the world had ever seen. It was, it was far, far, the death toll was five, 7,000. It was far higher than Guernica. And of course, we were still a few years away from the bombing of Chongqing, and then of course the blitz on London and the British cities and so on. So it's a, it's a very difficult one for even you know, national, nationalistic China to deal with, because it's like, it, it's kind of, it happens because the Japanese attacked, but it's also a kind of screw up by, well, the Guomingdang Air Force. So I, I wanted to tell that story through different perspectives on that day. So, and then, uh, so, so again, this was an attempt to take Shanghai out to, out to the world. And it, I, I realized when I was going around talking about midnight in Peking everywhere, that as soon as people said the inevitable question, what are you working on next? And you say, oh, Shanghai, 1930s. You could just see light bulbs going off in, in a way that you don't with Peking. You could see it. You could see, oh, Chong Sams, jazz, fast cars, cool, cool nightclubs. I also wanted people to understand that in 1940, um, the Shanghai Municipal Council picked up, you know, 13 and a half thousand dead bodies off the street of, of Shanghai. Unwanted babies, suicides, the highest suicide rate in the world. Russians who just couldn't find a way to make a living, people who died of the cold. When you fell through the cracks in old Shanghai, you really fell all the way to the bottom. There was no safety net. When you lived the high life, it was as high as life got. Right. And it was those two extremes, and that I wanted to show as well. So that, that kind of worked a little bit as well. But then I thought, I'll go back to the start again with this book, and I'll, I'll go and contact Pete Spurrier, the mad uh, independent publisher in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'll, I'll t I want to tell some stories that maybe don't interest everybody around the world, but will interest people who, who are interested in the region and China, about people who went to Shanghai, the foreigners that went to Shanghai. And some of them will be famous and are famous, but maybe you don't know they went to Shanghai and spent time there. Eugene O'Neill, who went in 1928 and had a mental breakdown in Shanghai with his, with his lover. Uh, Langston Hughes, the Harlem Renaissance poet, who went to Shanghai and uh, uh, was followed everywhere because he was considered probably a spy for the Russians, but loved it because he was away from segregation era uh, America. 
Um, who else is in there? Um, Arthur Ransom, who most people know for Swallows and Amazons. Um, but of course, before that, I mean, most people, don't, most people know Swallows and Amazons, right? The children's stories by Arthur Ransom. Um, but most people don't know that before that, he was quite a committed socialist and was a reporter for the Manchester Guardian. And that he went to the Soviet Union and he fell in love with a Russian woman. And Arthur Ransom was about yay high. And the woman he fell in love with was my height. She, actually an inch taller than me. She towered over him. And she was called Yevgenia Petrovna. And it so happened, which is a great one for a journalist, if you're going to fall in love with someone and you're reporting Russia, this is who you fall in love with in 1919. Right? She was Trotsky's secretary. Right? <laughs> so he fell in love with Trotsky's secretary. And Trotsky's secretary fell in love with him. So they, um, and they sort of embarked on this world tour together to go and report about China. And there's so much good information about it because British intelligence were following Arthur Ransom everywhere he went. Because it was rumored that Yevgenia Petrovna was not just in love with a socialistic Englishman. They weren't too worried about Arthur Ransom, you know, in the way that the Secret Service are probably not that worried about Jeremy Corbyn, right? It was just sort of well-meaning lefty kind of worry, right? And, um, but what they were worried was that Yevgenia was smuggling diamonds in her knickers. This is actually in the records. That they were in her knickers. And she was, as, as they went around the world, they were, she was dropping off a few diamonds to all these communist agents everywhere. And of course, they ended up in Shanghai in 1927 when Chiang Kai-shek was suppressing the left very brutally in Shanghai. And they were worried that she was dropping off a few diamonds to the nascent communist party there. And then they were moving on back to England. But he wrote a very excellent piece called uh, about the Shanghai mind, which if you, if you like me, had to live in Shanghai for a long time. If you've never spent any time in Shanghai, you'll know that the Shanghai mind still exists. Go to an Am Cham or a Brit Cham or an EU Cham in Shanghai, and you'll still get the Shanghai mind, which is this is the most important place on earth. Um, nowhere understands money and business as well as us here, right? And though we pay no taxes back to the UK or anywhere else, you should support us with gunboats if necessary, right? You know, this was the Shanghai mind, and it still exists. Um, you'll, still, you'll still get it. Um, so Arthur Ransom, yes. So whether or not she ever had any diamonds in her knickers was never established. The only person who knows that is Arthur Ransom, obviously, because he was literally in her knickers the whole time around. So he knew. Um, but unfortunately, she, um, she uh, yeah, I mean, they actually did come back to England, get married, and they died within six months of each other in a lovely little cottage up in the Lake District, actually. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and she was never done for anything. Um, who else is in here? Other people that you may not know came to Shanghai, but I think are very important. Louis Lamour, if you ever read Westerns, yeah. right? Yes, of course, Zane Grey. After that, probably Louis Lamour is the greatest writer of Westerns from America. He, as a merchant seaman and amateur boxer, came to Shanghai and uh, decided to get off the boat in Shanghai and worked as a uh, kind of sideshow boxer in a nightclub where they would have dancing and the chorus line. I mean, this is the... Mid-1920s, Shanghai's way, way, way on top of everything already. And halfway through, they would move the stage back and bring out a boxing ring. And two guys would go at each other for a while. And the, the whole skill was to kind of not be too brutal, so you put people off their dinner. But like, um, put up a good fight, you know, but not completely cover the audience with blood, kind of as you did it. Um, so he came, and he wrote three wonderful short stories, which, are, which you can find in his collections, about Shanghai. And one of them is really about a true story, and no one's ever sort of noticed this before, because everyone who wrote about Louis Lemoore's short stories wrote about him from, as an American writer or a writer of Westerns. But look, looking at it from a Sinology or a Chinese history perspective, he wrote a great one about a man who, uh, as many men did in the sort of 1920s and so on, fell in love with one of these gorgeous Russians that had turned up in, uh, in, in Shanghai. Um, and he was selling guns to the northern warlords at the time. And um, he, had always, he had done a very good business with them, selling guns. And um, he was going to sell another load. But he decided, I've got to get out of Shanghai because the Russian girlfriend wants to go. And we're going to go and be in love and everything. So he decided, that as they trusted him, to send a boat up the Yangtze to the warlords with all the crates of guns. But he just put two guns on top. And underneath, he just put a lot of lead pipe. And they had already paid him. So he had the money, and he sent lead pipe up to the warlords, thinking, we'll get on the boat tonight. But his girlfriend, the Russian girl, says, I cannot get on the boat tonight because there's this really great party going on, and I have to go to this party. 
because it's like the party of the year in Shanghai and I have to be there, right? And he's like, no, we've got to get the boat. And she's like, there's a boat next week. Don't worry about it. It doesn't make a big deal. He's like, no, no, we really have to get this boat. Anyway, of course, he loses the argument. He decides I'll probably be okay. And um, he goes to the party. Well, Louis Lamour lived in the same apartment building in Shanghai as him. And when he came back uh, in the morning from his boxing gig, outside was a loud, large crowd and gathered around looking slightly shocked. And outside the apartment building was set in the earth around a tree stump. It was a piece of the lead pipe with the head oh, of, uh, oh. of the guy. Now, that's always been read by people as, as a fictional story. But it's actually a true story of what happened to an American arms dealer in, in China at the time. Louis Lemoore was actually in, in there. So he was very good. Uh, Warner Oland, by the way, um, I just should tell you a few more of these. Warner Oland, who, who is the man who played Charlie Chan in all the movies. And um, the Chinese were always, quite rightly, very worried about yellow face and, and white actors playing Chinese and derogatory portrayals of Chinese. But they, when Warner Oland came to Shanghai, they mobbed him. They loved him because they felt they weren't quite sure if he wasn't Chinese because he was uh, Swedish. And, and he kind of told the newspapers that maybe he was Chinese or maybe there was a bit of Mongolian in him and things like that. He also claimed that he, there was lots of pictures of him. I have some in the book having uh, Gung Bao Ji Ding and everything in the uh, um, film studios uh, and everything, you know. And he would say, I'm learning Chinese. And, and throughout his career, if you track it on the newspapers, he always says, I'm learning Chinese. He never actually speaks any or, or says any. But he just says he is, right? And he turns up in Shanghai and he's got the, Fu Man, the, the sort of, not Fu Manchu, he's got the sort of Charlie Chan moustache. And he actually starts speaking like Charlie Chan. So all the Chinese journalists rush down and they say, what is it like to be in China, Mr. Oland? And he says, uh, Oland come China, feel very happy to be in ancient land and things like that. And of course, the Chinese journalists lap, lap up this kind of Charlie Chanism. And the government, the, the nationalist government, actually thought the movies were good because what they showed was a kind of... Uh, a teetotal, intellectual, crime-solving family man, you know, number one son and all of that, right? That, and, and they felt this was a good portrayal of the Chinese. So he was actually feted wherever he went. And in fact, the mayor of Shanghai threw a, threw a uh, banquet for him and gave him a moustache comb. <laughs> gave him a moustache comb, which is a nice gift to be given, isn't it? Um, yes, so I sort of did those. And there were a few others that, that maybe you know or maybe you don't know. I mean, I certainly, I put Alistair Crowley in there. People who know anything about the occult, the British occult tradition, will know about Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley is the first example that I know of, of someone who came all the way to China just to try and get a shag. There was a woman who had been an admirer of him, and he had, he had contacted her. He was known as the Beast 666, right? and she had been in his occult thing. She moved to Hong Kong, and they said that they would meet every night. She moved to Shanghai later, but she was mostly in Hong Kong. They would meet every, every Saturday night at 7 p.m. on the astral plane and make love, right? So when I went through this, I went through all the records that I could find of this, both her letters and his letters to each other. And it's like 7 o'clock Saturday, we meet on the astral plane where we will make love, right? And I suddenly realized when I'm halfway through this, because then he decides to come to Shanghai where she's moved, because he says, the astral plane thing's all right you know? But I'm kind of thinking maybe we should sort of do it for real, right? And, I, and, I, and I, when I worked it out, I worked out that at no point do they ever mention the time difference, right? They never mention the time difference. So my theory is the reason the astral plane sex didn't work was that um, seven o'clock Hong Kong time, there she was lying on her bed going, Alistair, I'm on the astral plane, take me, right? And of course, you know, he wasn't even up yet, right? And then... Seven o'clock at night, he rushes back from the pub. He rushes back from the pub, gets his kit off and lies on the bed going, right, I'm ready to go. And she's like, it's 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. And as, as you know, no one likes to be woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning for sex. So, um, so, so I think that's why it didn't work. So he came, to, uh, he, he came to Shanghai, all the way to Shanghai. And he didn't come the easy way. He didn't come on a boat. He came to Indochina and then walked up across mountains and then down through Kunming and everything. He walked all the way, right? Now, this is a man who is desperate for a shag. Right? He, if you walk all the way from Kunming to Shanghai, right, just try and sit with her. And when he got there, she said, 
no, basically. She said no. So, uh, so, so it was all a bit of a disaster. So some of these stories are a bit damp squid. I'm afraid he, he never got to sleep with her. She, she'd gone off him by the time he got there. Um, so that, that was a bit weird. Um, there's, there's a few others I, I, people may know. Um, who am I trying to think of? Oh, Penelope Fitzgerald. She's the last one in the book, really. Penelope Fitzgerald. Not, not a lot of people know this. I only knew because um, someone told me that they'd been researching her and they'd found this, um, this notebook in her archive. And, and they said to me, you really have to go and look at this notebook. And what it is, when you, when you open it from the back, it's the first 30, 40 pages of her great novel, The Bookshop which is, you know, the, the, book, the book she's best known for, all about a small English town and the petty jealousies and someone trying to run a bookshop, right? As you know, you know, <laughs> all troublesome customers, local officials, all the rest of it, right? <laughs> um, but the person said to me, that's at the back and that's what all the scholars look at, that she started writing it in this notebook and how it differs from the final text. That's what literary scholars like. He said, flip it round. It's her diary of a trip to China in 1977. She came to Shanghai and Beijing in 1977 on the first ever British package holiday to China that, that um, Thompson's, the, the package holiday people, organized. And, and, and she came and she, she'd been around Beijing and then around Shanghai and she was so fed up. You know, you know how organized these tours are now. Imagine what they were like in 1977. She was so fed up and she wasn't allowed to leave the hotel and she couldn't sleep because of the steam heating and everything, that she just flipped her diary around and started writing the bookshop in the back of it. And so that was where that book was created. But then there's a load of people that no one will know that I wanted to write about. Lida Roberti was a Hollywood star uh, in comedy movies. Um, and she was, bo she was born as a Russian emigre in Shanghai, but went there. Um, and uh, I did a lot of work on a woman called Lily Floor, who I'm fascinated by. And, and, and again, I mean, my sort of final point is really, everyone still sends me things. So Lily Floor was, um, um, Jewish from Vienna, she was in a family act that was in the Yiddish Music Hall in Vienna and then she became a star of the silent movies in Berlin, she was a sort of comedy actress in silent movies. 1934, she's not allowed to work in the movies anymore because she's Jewish and the Nazi prescription. She comes to Shanghai because her husband does a bit of business here, uh, there. So she goes to Shanghai and um, she becomes a sort of singer in nightclubs in Shanghai. And then, because she's there before the Jewish refugees, when the Jewish refugee comes, she does lots of charity work to raise money for the Jewish refugees. At some point, she loses the original husband, marries another husband. And after the war, she moved to uh, Sydney, Australia, and just never performed again. She just became a housewife down in Sydney, um, which is quite common, actually. You get lots of them that were showgirls and things like that, and they marry and then go to somewhere like Sydney or Oxford or somewhere, and they never sort of do anything again. But since I did that, which I was hoping would happen with this book, I've had lots of people contact me to say, oh, my mum's got a programme. She lived in Shanghai in the war, and she's got a programme for a performance she did. Or even someone just sent me a poster for, for a performance that she did. So things like that come out. Um, and I've got various other things in there. I also did a big thing on the gypsy Roma community of Shanghai. No one's ever researched the Roma in Shanghai before. But I found out that there were about 300 Romani people in Shanghai, mostly engaged in the entertainment industry, because that sort of gypsy jazz was very popular in the 1930s. But they were, they, they were never recorded properly, because they were, most of them had come from Russia. So they were recorded as Russians, and there was no sort of subdivision. I mean, you know, actually, although we have 25, 30,000 Jewish refugees in there, about 20% of the, of the Russian exodus was also Jewish. So, you know, th but they're always qualified, counted as Russians rather than Jews as such. So, so th we have those kind of things. And I did a big piece on um, Ellie the Swiss, who I'm very fond of, Ellie the Swiss. And he was a uh, Swiss gangster. In, uh, that does sound silly, doesn't it, a Swiss gangster? <laughs> he was a Swiss gangster in, um, in, uh, in Shanghai. And um, there's some great photos of him, like kind of Ocean's Eleven type pictures of all, all of that family. And he... Um, policeman going, 
bang and he has to take one in the chest in order to in order to finish the deal to prove because they weren't going to take it on on for trust that these things work huh for every vest. no they just did it for one vest yeah yeah that's a good point actually yeah yeah so um so he was in there. Now, there, I had been told a story that when he was in Shanghai in about 1942, he was actually finally arrested by the Japanese who got fed up of him because he was Swiss, so he's neutral. And, but they finally got fed up of him and they arrested him and threw him in Bridge House, which was the Japanese torture chamber in um, Shanghai. And he was in there with the Doolittle Raiders, uh, the, um, the Americans that flew the missions to, uh, to bomb Japan bomb Tokyo when the Japanese thought they were safe and that the American pilots couldn't get that far. But they didn't have enough petrol to get back to their base. So they bailed out all across China and a number of them were ca captured and taken to Shanghai and Bridge House. He was in there. And I'd heard a rumor that after he got out of there, he, who by then was in his 50s, married an 18-year-old Russian girl. And, um, and uh, that, they, that somehow, somehow they managed to get out and go to America. And I'd never been able to follow that story through. I'd found a various branch of the family who gave me some photos, but I never found that core family. And literally two nights ago, when I was in, first came down here and stayed in Gary's house, after Gary had um, given me some pizza and got me pretty drunk, he sent me off to bed. And um, I literally got a um, Facebook message from someone who said, are you the guy writing about Ellie the Swiss Whittler? And when um, I'm the daughter from the second marriage of the 18-year-old girl that you say he married, She's now 90 something or other, and she'd love to talk to you. And we're going to have a phone conversation. Oh, wow. So she's still alive. And she is like, for me now, to find someone who was a witness to like, you know, 1940 Shanghai is like getting really, really difficult to find anyone like that. But just because of this, she was only 18, in, in that, so, so she's still around. So I'm going to talk to her. And I said like, okay, I've got to do an event on Sunday. But Monday I need to talk to you because I thought like, because I've had this happen to me before that you say like, oh, I'm a bit busy this month. I'll talk to you next month. And you get an email saying, oh, you know, they, they, they're not there. I mean, uh, one of the women in this book who's absolutely fantastic white Russian dancer, I was in long conversations with her. She sent me loads of great pictures of her in Peking performing all dressed up like Dietrich and, and, and everything. And I had so many questions for her. And then I just got an email one day from her, from her daughter saying she, she passed away in the night kind of thing so you know they're dying and the other thing i would say to you in case you're uh, interested in if you have things that you come across is the other big problem we've got at the moment is photographs so of course we have lots of photographs of old shanghai and beijing and hong kong as well because they were done as tin types or whatever but as soon as the kodak paper comes in we get lots of photos which i have in all of the books of people in nightclubs and it's just snap snap here we all are right that paper has a 70 year life. So that paper is now starting to disintegrate. And I've already had people who say, oh, I've got a biscuit tin up in the roof with photos in and they're going up and it's just, they've, the pictures have just disintegrated. So if they haven't scanned them in and photographed them, you know, and of course that kind of paper, the slightest bit of damp or anything like that just destroys it. So, so we actually are like now in a position where we're starting to lose photographs if people have them in the attic and haven't quite dug them out yet. So that's the, so for me to finish up, that's all of these stories are great. And I wanted to do this one with Pete because I thought what I'll do with Pete is this hopefully is of interest to people here in China. Um, and we'll do this one. And then I'm just trying to finish now another one called Destination Peking, which will be 18 stories of foreigners, famous and not so famous, and a few gangsters that went to... Um, to um, Peking and I hope to do um, Singapore and Hong Kong because I have some stories on Singapore and even Hong Kong so um, I want to do it and then we can just do four of them and um, hopefully um, that will keep that will keep Pete in Qingdao for, uh, for a little bit so uh, <laughs> and make me a bit of money as well so yeah so the, the most wonderful thing about all of these I've found because I just work on this kind of subject area is I've kind of now become the sort of go-to guy on the internet for these things and I'm getting emails on a sort of almost daily basis certainly on a weekly basis from people who are like my grandmother or my mother lived at 93 Carter Road Shanghai what's that address now you know uh, is that house still there and I'm just like well, I can tell you that, but have you got any photos? Have you got any paperwork? Have you got any documents or whatever? Because we need to do this as a, let's do a little trade, right? Send me your photos and I'll send you the information. And I'm getting that so regularly now. And I get it a little bit from Hong Kong, though I'm obviously not so associated with Hong Kong. Uh, 
but I, I definitely get it from people who are were up in China all the time. And that's just giving me so much material and adding so much um, to everything. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, my blog at chinariming.com, I, when I get stuff like that, I tend to just put it up on the blog, partly as an aid memoir to myself, so I don't forget it, and it gives me a searchable database, but I just put lots of stuff up and, and adverts for shops and, and everything like that, for shops in old Shanghai and Beijing, not like welcome supermarkets. And, up on the up on the site so um, that for me is the, is the greatest thing is that every day when I get up and switch my email on now I kind of um, am getting stuff from people who are getting in contact oh I knew so and so or my dad lived down the road from that person and so it's kind of I'm, I'm kind of building up this enormous database of old Shanghaiers and old Pekingers but um, hopefully uh, people down here like it or even though it's about up there um, but um, and and to just reiterate, to, to finish where we started, support your local bookshop because it's where you find all these things. But thank you so much for coming out on a Sunday. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>